the thunderous clash of lances shattering against shields, the roar of the crowd, and the romantic allure of a knight dedicating his joust to a lady fair. These are the images that often come to mind when we think of medieval knights. Often romanticized in tales like King Arthur, knights have captured our collective imagination as paragons of honor and virtue. But how much do we really know about these armored warriors? Were their lives truly as glamorous as the tales suggest? Or is this veneer of romance merely a facade, masking a life fraught with violence, danger, and moral ambiguity? In this video, we will delve into the complex world of medieval knights, peeling back the layers of romanticism to reveal the gritty realities and enduring legacies of these iconic figures. The concept of knighthood has its roots in the early medieval period, specifically in the 9th and 10th centuries. As feudalism took hold across Europe, the need for a class of mounted warriors to protect lands and serve their lords became increasingly apparent. The term knight itself derives from the Old English word knight, which refers to a young man or a servant. By the 11th century, particularly after the Norman conquest of England in 1066, the role of knights became more formalized. As the elite warriors of medieval Europe, knights played a crucial role in the battlefield, leading the charge against the enemy lines and breaking their formations. One of the earliest demonstrations of the power of knights in conflict was at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. After luring their enemies out of position, the Norman knights were able to charge at high speed and break through the lines of enemy infantry. The path to becoming a knight was a rigorous process that began in childhood and involved years of training and education. Typically, a boy born into a noble family would be sent off to another noble household to begin his training as a page around the age of seven. As a page, the young boy would learn basic skills like riding and falconry. He might also be taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, along with lessons in courtesy, religion, and music. The idea was to shape not just a warrior, but a well-rounded individual who could function effectively in both the royal court and on the battlefield. At the age of 14 or 15, the page would graduate to the next level of his training and become a squire. This term, derived from the old French esquire, originally meant shield-bearer, and that was one of the squire's primary duties, to serve as an attendant to a knight, carrying his shield, armor, and weapons. But the role of a squire was far more comprehensive. He would train intensively in combat skills, learning how to handle various weapons like swords and lances. He would also practice mounted combat, mastering the art of fighting on horseback, which was crucial for medieval warfare. Then, the squire would accompany his knight to tournaments and battles, gaining practical experience and sometimes even participating in combat. The culmination of this long period of training was the dubbing ceremony, where the squire would be formally made a knight at around 20 years of age. The ceremony was steeped in religious symbolism and often began with a ritual bath, symbolizing purification. The squire would then spend a night in a vigil, praying and meditating, before attending a church service the next morning. The actual dubbing involved the knight-elect, kneeling before a senior knight or lord who would tap him lightly on the shoulders with a sword in a gesture known as the accolade. This was often followed by the girding of a sword belt and the bestowing of spurs, both symbolic of the new knight's responsibilities and duties. The young man was now a knight. The armor and weapons of a medieval knight were both tools of war and symbols of status. Early in the medieval period, Knights often wore chainmail, a type of armor made from interlocking rings of metal, which provided a good balance between protection and mobility. However, as metallurgical techniques advanced and the nature of warfare changed, knights began to adopt plate armor. This type of armor consisted of large metal plates that were shaped to fit various parts of the body, offering superior protection against cutting and piercing weapons. A full suit of plate armor could weigh between 45 to 55 pounds and was often custom-made to fit the knight perfectly. The helmet was another crucial component of a knight's armor. Early versions, like the nasal helm, offered basic protection 
but left much of the face exposed. Over time, helmets evolved into more protective designs like the Great Helm, a bucket-shaped helmet that covered the entire head, and the Bassinet, which featured a movable visor. These helmets often included a feature known as the Aventail, a curtain of chainmail that hung from the helmet to protect the neck and shoulders. The primary weapon of a knight was the sword, often a double-edged weapon designed for slashing and thrusting. The design of swords varied, with some like the arming sword being one-handed, and others like the long sword designed for two-handed use. Knights also used lances, long wooden poles with a metal tip, especially when fighting on horseback. The lance was employed in a technique known as couched lance combat, where the knight would tuck the lance under his arm and charge at the enemy, using the momentum of the horse to deliver a powerful blow. Other weapons like maces, flails, and war hammers were also part of the knightly arsenal, each serving specific functions in combat. Shields were another essential piece of equipment. Early shields were often kite-shaped and made of wood, designed to protect the knight from arrows and sword blows. Later, as plate armor became more prevalent, shields evolved into smaller, more compact forms like the heater shield, which was easier to maneuver. The code of chivalry was the ethical and moral compass that guided knights in medieval society, serving as an unwritten set of rules that dictated behavior on and off the battlefield. Derived from the old French term chevalerie, which means horsemanship, chivalry evolved to encompass a broader set of virtues and responsibilities. While there was no single, universally accepted code, several key principles were commonly emphasized, including loyalty, courage, and courtesy. These virtues were meant to influence everything from interpersonal relationships to military conduct. One of the most important elements of the chivalric code was the concept of fealty, an oath of loyalty sworn by a knight to his lord. This oath was a contractual obligation. Fealty dictated that a knight must serve his lord faithfully, even at the risk of his own life. In return, the lord was expected to treat his vassals with fairness and to protect them and their interests. Another cornerstone of chivalry was the idea of courtly love, a form of romantic devotion often directed towards a lady usually someone other than the knight's wife. Popularized in troubadour poetry and later in Arthurian legends, courtly love was considered a noble pursuit, elevating both the knight and the lady involved. It was a platonic ideal, more about admiration and respect than physical love, and it often served as a metaphorical context in which the knight could demonstrate his virtues. The chivalric code also extended to the battlefield, where knights were expected to show bravery, skill, and fairness. The notion of just war was important. Knights were encouraged to fight for righteous causes and to avoid unnecessary cruelty. Prisoners, especially fellow knights, were to be treated with respect. This was not just a matter of ethics, but also of practicality. Ransoming captured knights was a common practice, and treating prisoners well increased the likelihood of receiving a good ransom. At the core of a knight's duty was his military service, often formalized through a feudal contract known as a fiefdom. In exchange for a parcel of land, or fief, granted by a lord, the knight was obligated to provide military service for a specified number of days each year. This could involve defending the lord's territory, participating in campaigns, or even serving in a garrison. The knight's military role was not just that of a warrior, but also often as a commander, responsible for training and leading troops into battle. However, the knight's responsibilities were not confined to warfare. Many knights held judicial and administrative roles within their fiefs. They might serve as judges in local courts, resolving disputes and administering justice. This was part of the manorial system, a localized economic structure where the knight or lord had economic rights over peasants who worked the land. The knight was responsible for the well-being of these peasants, providing protection in return for labor or rent. Of all of their regular duties, knights particularly looked forward to participating in events known as tournaments and jousts. These were a kind of sporting festival, but they also doubled as social and political gatherings. 
A tournament was also seen as a form of entertainment for the general public, who would often gather to watch them take place. Jousting was often just one kind of competition at a tournament, and it was an event where two knights would charge at each other on horseback while holding shields and lances. The aim was to knock the other person off their horse and thereby proving who the better knight was. Such tournaments allowed knights to demonstrate their martial skill, increase their reputation, and even capture opponents for ransom. They also provided an opportunity for alliances to be formed and for young knights to gain experience. The decline of traditional medieval knighthood was a gradual process, influenced by a number of factors. One of the most significant turning points was the Hundred Years' War between England and France, which spanned from 1337 to 1453. The war saw the increasing use of longbows and firearms, weapons that could penetrate the heavy armor of knights. The Battle of Agincourt in 1415 was one stark example, where English longbowmen decimated the French cavalry, casting doubt on the effectiveness of knights in the face of evolving military technology. Another blow to the institution of knighthood came with the decline of feudalism. The rise of centralized monarchies and professional armies reduced the military importance of knights. By the late 15th and early 16th centuries, the feudal system had become largely obsolete, replaced by more modern forms of governance and military organization. The Wars of the Roses in England, which concluded in 1487, marked one of the last instances where knights played a significant role in a major conflict. Despite their decline, the legacy of knights and knighthood has endured, deeply embedded in Western culture and imagination. The chivalric code, though no longer a guiding principle in modern warfare, has influenced Western ethics and moral systems. Concepts like honor, bravery, and loyalty, virtues central to the chivalric code, still resonate today. Moreover, the figure of the knight continues to captivate the public imagination, immortalized in literature, art, and even video games. From the Arthurian legends that have been retold in countless variations to modern interpretations like Game of Thrones, the knight remains a symbol of a bygone era, romanticized yet also scrutinized for its complexities and contradictions. I hope you have enjoyed learning about medieval knights, if you'd like to explore the Middle Ages further, be sure to watch our video about the feudal system. I look forward to seeing you again soon in our next video.